Okay, um, good morning everybody, or good afternoon I should say, probably where a lot of you are, but good morning from here. Um, first of all, thank you Clemens for um, instigating the talk um, and for um, organizing everything and thank you to everybody at the Middle East uh, Institute at National University of Singapore for, 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 for putting this talk on this morning. I'm very grateful. Um, as Clemens said, there's a Cambridge University Press discount code which will be shown uh, again at the end of the, of the talk. And I'd also like to stress at the moment, if anybody um, doesn't have an opportunity to ask a question or is a, there's a question that they think of that they would like to ask later, for example, uh, then please contact me um, by email and I can give you that at the end of the talk as well. Um, so in answer to, to uh, the, the questions that Clemens uh, just mentioned about why did I decide to write this book, um, now, obviously, those of you who know my research, who, who, who know sort of publications, previous publications, will know that I've actually done a quite a lot of work on Saudi women. Um, so the choice of sort of to write a book on young Saudi men had nothing to do with disregarding the female uh, role in Saudi Arabia. But rather what I noticed, particularly since sort of 2016, since the launch of Saudi Vision 2030, was that a lot of the socio-economic reforms, the societal developments that we witnessed in Saudi Arabia, um, particularly in the West, um, were sort of really looked at through the prism of, of, of the, the, the female role in Saudi Arabia and how this was impacting on that. So I felt that there's, you know, in all actuality, there's two sides to the coin. And I felt that it was very important to actually look at how these issues were impacting on young men as well. Because obviously you need to, you know, that but by looking at how these issues impact on young men, that actually also informs you about the, 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 the growth, you know, this sort of the developing role of young Saudi women in society. So this was a very conscious decision to do this. Um, and I do feel at times that it's not just a, a sort of an issue in Saudi Arabia, but I think sometimes in general it's an issue that, you know, the role or the perceptions of, of young men are sometimes sort of disregarded, you know, and I so I thought it was very important to, to look at this. Um, in terms of my research methodology, um, I... Uh, <laughs> Knowing, I mean, for me, when I do research in Saudi Arabia, it's very important to uh, take into consideration the uh, sort of socio-cultural context of living in Saudi Arabia. And um, Saudi Arabia is a very, um, um, you know, a very social uh, country. I mean, I mean, going out, meeting people, uh, having fun, all of these things are an incredibly important part of life. And um, those of you who know the work but Caroline Montague, for example, who wrote a very interesting report a few years ago about civil society in Saudi Arabia. And, you know, Caroline talked about, you know, how Saudi Arabia is a very groupy society. You know, people like to sort of go to the Majlis, the Diwaniya, the Istidaha. You know, this is all part of life. So when I decided to um, research, do the research for the book, I thought, well, the best way for me to do that would be to organize focus groups uh, around Saudi Arabia. And this is what I did. So in the end, I did around, I think it was around 55 different focus groups but with young men aged between 18 to 26, approximately, in all regions of the kingdom, um, not just in the main cities. Um, uh, so I had to travel a lot, obviously, to, to sort of very diverse places, whether in Kasim or the Seer or Katif or, and organize, and I organized these focus groups so that um, I always went to them. Um, I always met them on their terms and I always met them in places that they felt comfortable. So we would meet on the beach, in the park, in the Istiraha, in the desert, um, wherever. And maybe um, you can put some photographs up now of some of these focus groups for everybody to see. Thank you very much. So, so here, this, for example, is one in a coffee shop in Abha. Um, this is one, uh, yes, you can see that. So this is, and this is one uh, in, in a park <laughs> in Shakia. 
this is one at a wedding in Al Hassa, uh, where we had a focus group after a wedding. This is at, in the desert in Kasim. Um, uh, this is uh, another one. This one I think was in Riyadh. Oh, that was in Ramadan. That was at four o'clock in the morning when we had the focus group <laughs> because it was Ramadan, obviously. Uh, this is also in Kasim. This was at somebody's private museum uh, in Kasim that we had the focus group there. And I think the next one, yes, so this is up dune, we were out dune bashing uh, in, in the desert outside, outside Al Mithnab. And this is a group from Najran uh, where we met. So, so all of these young people, I met them, you know, I went to them and I met them very much on their terms in places that they felt comfortable. Um, and as I said, approximately 55 uh, of these groups. Um, I was always asked before the focus group started about, you know, how long was this going to take? And I would sort of say, well, around an hour. Um, it was never an hour. It was always two hours, three hours, four hours. The one in Ramadan, I think, was about seven hours. And, and in fact, some of them actually took place over two, three days. For example, this one in the desert, we actually met over three days in the place in Kasim. So it was very informal and very social. Uh, and actually, of course, by having these sort of long conversations, um, I was able to really sort of delve deep into what a lot of the problems and what a lot of the issues and the concerns are of these young men in, in, in sort of very diverse parts of the kingdom. Um, and of course, I didn't record any of these um, uh, meetings because again, once you start recording the meeting, then it sort of changes the dynamic. So I took notes only and I usually, you know, I took notes either during and then I wrote the notes up sort of afterwards and I ended up with something like 90,000 words of notes. So it was a very productive process. Yeah. And this whole focus group thing took over just over a year, it took about a year to do all of this. I have to say, it was also, um, you know, great fun. And I, you know, to go to all these places, to be involved in all of this sort of social life as well, in sort of quite, sometimes quite remote parts of Saudi Arabia. I, and for me, it was an incredible learning experience. I mean, I learned so much. Um, but I also made sure that obviously, I needed to, to talk to as many young men as possible from as many different backgrounds as possible. So not just different in terms of their educational background, um, their sort of socioeconomic background, um, their employment background, um, their family background. Um, so it was very important to do that. So even when I did sort of uh, focus groups in Riyadh, for example, I made sure that I met different groups of people in Riyadh from different from different sort of societal constituencies in Riyadh and not just sort of you know sort of the well educated in employment but also those who are unemployed yes or those who who were not actually from Riyadh but had been forced to move to Riyadh because there were no jobs where in their hometowns so I tried to get as as diverse a sort of cross-section of young men as possible. And I think if you read the book, you know, they, um, you'll see that there's quite a, you know, I go into this in quite a lot of depth about sort of the, all the different types of people that I met. Um, and of course, that, that, that was incredibly important because the talks, the focus groups that I had with everybody, the, the subjects that we discussed in these focus groups, that then actually determined the chapters of the book. You know, so so I I had ideas that I wanted to talk about, but actually, it was the when I sort of finished the the, the research the the year doing the focus groups, and I went through all my research notes and everything, that determined the chapters, that determined what went into the book. When so I was very, you know, I felt that it was, you know, I hope it's representative of what those views were. Particularly, obviously, those views have changed recently because of sort of. Um, recent global developments. But I think, uh, I think a lot of the issues that are talked at in the book are, are still extremely important. I think as well, you know, that, that although, although this is a book about young Saudi men, 
the issues discussed in the book are applicable to all Saudi youths, whether male or female. And in fact, a lot of the issues that are discussed in the book are applicable to young people everywhere. You yeah. know, such as, yeah. find, such as finding a job, getting on the, you know, getting on the property ladder. You know, these are, so although I'm looking at a sort of specific constituency in the kingdom, actually what's interesting is, is actually how how relevant these issues are to so many young people all over the world. And obviously now when we look at the ramifications of the coronavirus pandemic, um, you know, we can see that it's actually exacerbated uh, some, of those, some of those issues. So yeah. I did do individual interviews as well, of course. Um, I did interview, um, I did have some focus groups with young women uh, for the chapter on gender deliberately to sort of, sort of, sort of be able to sort of um, compare the sort of expectations between young men and young women and I did do um, online surveys sort of written written surveys obviously in Arabic written surveys quite short written surveys um, but that was really more to sort of back up um, um, the data that I had that I got from the, the focus groups because really it was it's the focus groups that provided the real sort of meat of the, of the research and as I say this is this to me this was just the obvious way to do it because this was a way that people felt comfortable this was a way that people you know wanted to have this discussion um disagreed with each other agreed with each other so you got this sort of much more sort of nuance about about what was sort of being discussed in the kingdom and even if if there was one issue for example employment that was important to everybody i spoke to uh, wherever i went you actually could tell that there were sort of degrees of importance, you know, depending on who you were speaking to and where they were from and what have you. So I think, I think, you know, that this, this, this research methodology allowed me to sort of, to sort of draw out those, some of those nuances, which I think is, is extremely important because there is a tendency um, when we talk about Saudi Arabia, I mean, and we all do it because it's, it's normal, but you know, there is a tendency to sort of generalize sometimes, you know, Saudi youth, Saudi women, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, Saudi Arabia full stop. And it's not this huge, it's not a humo homogenous society. You know, it's not a hom homogenous kingdom. There's huge diversity, huge cultural diversity and, and, and socioeconomic diversity. And even within, you know, one area, uh, you know, for example, you know, you can go to a town and I had focus groups, you know, in different parts of that town, for example, there would be differences between different districts of the town. So I think drawing out those nuances is extremely important. Yes. Um, and the focus groups actually help you get to be as representative, get as representative a sample as possible in yes. Saudi Arabia. And one yeah. of the things you mentioned is that, you know, very commonly, scholars tend to look at the urban belt that goes from west to east in Saudi Arabia. And, yes. and there is a need to develop uh, uh, that north to south uh, parts of Saudi Arabia. So, I mean, judging from your focus groups and the answers that you obtain, uh, are there, what are the real, I mean, the core differences between the urban cores, the urban cities and the rural areas that you, that you manage to, to pick out some? Of the people and, and find out what they thought. Well, yeah, well, obviously, uh, you know, over the, over the years, one of the biggest issues that we've seen in Saudi Arabia is this sort of very rapid urbanization. Um, and the fact that, you know, the vast majority of Saudis now live in cities. I mean, Riyadh is now a city of what sort of approximately 8 million people or something. I mean, I remember when I first went to Riyadh in January 2001, and it was, you know, in those days still sort of quite sort of I don't know sleepy almost you know it wasn't really it wasn't this huge vibrant massive capital city that it is now and it's the same with Jeddah you know those of you who know Jeddah it's the same you know northern Jeddah is just spread enormously in the eastern province you know you have uh, Damam, Koba, Daran and Katif as well which all used to be separate places but are actually now one all huge conurbation um, so, and the, this massive um, uh, urbanization, of course, and the sort of increase in population in the urban centers, of course, is mainly due to internal migration, um, mainly due to a lot of these young people moving into the cities. And of course, the number one issue um, is employment. Um, and a very important issue for those who are not 
native to Riyadh or to Jeddah or what have you, is, is that actually, of course, they're forced very often to move from their hometowns to the cities to find a job, even though even if they don't want to. Um, and the, you know, the alternative is very often to remain unemployed um, because there simply aren't either public sector jobs or private sector jobs in sort of small urban towns such as Afladj, for example, in, which is sort of, you know, sort of um, about three, three and a half, four hours south of Riyadh on, the, on just near the empty quarter. Um, places like Misnev, as I just mentioned before. So I think for a lot of, or certainly in ASEA, so, you know, obviously when you go to the the regional parts of Saudi Arabia, I mean, some of them are noticeably less wealthy, um, noticeably. And obviously, when you talk to young people there, you know, their main concern is, is that, you know, they might, you know, they're going to be forced to move to the city because, you know, they won't be able to sort of work at home, even though they want to. So a lot, you know, what you find, of course, is there's a lot of young men will go to, you know, they'll move to one of the main urban cities to work they'll save the money or they'll try and save the money and then, you know, in order to be able to buy a property back in their hometown, you know, so that they can go back there at some stage. But of course, that, what that does mean, of course, is that inside the main cities like Riyadh or Koba Damam, you know, you have these sort of very large communities that come from other parts of the kingdom. Um, so if you visit Riyadh, for example, and you decide to drive to Kasim for the weekend, which is sort of just north of, you know, about three hours north of Riyadh, you know, and you drive out on a Thursday evening before the, uh, uh, before the weekend starts, I mean, the road to Kasim is just chock a block with cars all the way there with everybody going home for the weekend or going home for the Eid holidays. So, so you have this sort of migration sort of from the cities back to the, the sort of the, the regional uh, areas as well. But I, I do think, you know, my, my concern, uh, which I think I mentioned in the book as well, my concern is that Riyadh um, <coughs> could become a bit like London in that there's such an over-concentration of everything in Riyadh. I mean, everything happens in Riyadh today, everything. You know, and if you want to get ahead, you've got to go to Riyadh. You know, everything important is in Riyadh. And my concern is that, you know, Riyadh will become like London in that, you know, London is London. It's not the United Kingdom. It's, it's a completely separate entity in a way. You know, and I'm sort of concerned that what, you know, that is the sort of same thing that you could find happening in Riyadh, which of course then could spark the sort of, sort of anti sort of, if you like, urbanization, globalization sort of trend that we sort of saw back in 2016. Um, but it is a concern, of course, I think. And, uh, and, and, you know, obviously, there are a lot of young people in some of the, the, the regional areas, you know, not, are not just concerned about about employment issue, you know, not just about the, you know, sort of enough, in, enough jobs in their areas, but there's also sort of all the related things related to, you know, the social contract, whether it's healthcare, whether it's the, you know, education, um, availability of, of housing and things like this. Although obviously, you know, that, you know, when it comes to housing and what have you, that's obviously um, uh, more of a problem in the big urban centers. But there is a difference. There is a huge difference. And I think, you know, to understand Saudi Arabia, you can't just sort of go to Riyadh and sort of stay in the central Riyadh and, you know, that's, you know, maybe pop over to Jeddah. You, you know, you have to, you know, you really have to get out to the the regional the regions to the cities in the regions to the towns in the regions and if you're lucky enough to the villages in the regions you know to actually see you know really quite huge differences sometimes huge differences um and but that's what makes it fascinating as well yeah. i mean I, anybody who's thinking of going i mean you know i would absolutely recommend that you you know you do these things because it's a it's 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 not only is it it's great fun of course and it's it's just so interesting yeah yeah, man, you mentioned about employment uh, being a concern and also um, about urbanization or the lack of uh, between different regional parts of Saudi Arabia. And then you have also the concerns about socioeconomic liberalization uh, initiatives that were launched by the Crown Prince himself, Mohammed bin Salman. Mm. And, and this is the part where I try to bridge your first and last chapters or second last chapters 
on Saudi identity and right. uh, Vision 2030 that was launched by the Crown Prince himself. Um, how far do young Saudi men actually buy into that nationalist narrative that you know he will improve the lives of young men, and and is his actually is, is his youthful profile of the prince an enabler in terms of convincing the youth in mm-hmm. that sense? What do they think about him? What do they think about his plans? I mean, it's been a it's been a few years since he mm-hmm. he. He came to power uh, in his position. So what are the perceptions of his plans and him as a personality? Well, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, these are obviously all extremely important points. Um, when Saudi, uh, you know, when Saudi Vision 2030 was sort of launched in, in April 2016, I mean, this was a watershed moment because you suddenly had, you know, a much, much, much younger leader, you know, introducing and talking about sort of the need for reforms, the need for socioeconomic reforms, the need to be less all dependent and things like this on national television. You know, and this was really, you know, something completely new. You know, for years and years and years, you know, there had always been, you know, the the the, the idea of the of Saudi leadership or of Saudi leaders had always been sort of sort of quite elderly men. You know, um, so this was sort of, if you like, just that whole idea of that somebody younger was now. Um, you know, sort of involved in very heavily in decision making was obviously a breath of fresh air in a country where 60% of the population is under the age of 30. I mean, Saudi Arabia is a very young country in terms of its demographics. And I think sometimes if, if people haven't visited Saudi Arabia, it might sort of be something that they're not so, so aware of. But when you actually, you know, when you're actually there, you know, I know when I'm overseas and then I go back to Saudi Arabia, it's sort of, you know, I, something I, I notice how, how, how young it is. You know, I go to the mall on a Friday and I sort of ask myself, you know, you know, am I the oldest person here? <laughs> you know, it's a, so this is, this is very, very important. Linked to that, of course, which is, which is also very important, is that Saudi Arabia's young population is increasingly well-educated, increasingly aspirational, increasingly interconnected, not just with their peers within the kingdom, but regionally and indeed internationally. Social media, as you probably know, has just Take, took off in Saudi Arabia after 2009. So everybody is sort of very, you know, the, the, so there's a huge awareness about a lot of these issues. So, so suddenly when this happened in 2016, it was very, um, you know, it was, it was very, you know, it, it excited a lot of people, of course. I think the, I remember watching this with a group of young Saudis in Riyadh and, you know, my initial reaction was, um, you know, that the danger was sort of raising expectations too high. You know, all of a sudden it was like, woof, you know, but I think, you know, by and large, um, you know, there was a lot of excitement about the possibilities that this might offer and, and that there's sort of the, you know, certainly from the socioeconomic side, the, the sort of the loosening up, if you like, of, 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 of sort of some of those sort of very sort of, sort of, um, uh, sort of, intransigent sort of situations that we used to find um so there yes yeah, so there was definitely yeah, definitely the idea that this had opened a door that this had allowed people to start exploring things that they hadn't really been able to do before and of course you know in the wake of this we saw um you know sort of um a lot of things that had been sort of below the surface that had that had been happening for many years but had not have been that had been below the surface and were not really being promoted by the government or by any of the authorities suddenly suddenly started to be promoted such as culture and art and and you know young saudis are 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 very you know a lot of young saudis are incredibly artistic and incredibly entrepreneurial as well so we saw all of that entrepreneurial trend sort of really take off as well so without a doubt you know this was you know this was this was popular um and this actually you know it resonated with with lots and lots of young people because i you know there was no doubt that that for a long time there was this feeling of you know and i talk about it in the book you know this feel particularly amongst young men and you know this feeling of you know nothing to do nowhere to go you know these sort of very these social restrictions which could be very sort of um very difficult for for young people to sort of live with and sort of try and have a sort of sort of you know 
sort of a bit more of a, a a fun life if you were so of course that 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 was all that 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 was all very popular when it was first launched and so therefore i think you know by and large you know young you know a lot of young saudis sort of felt that 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 that, that the crown prince was sort of if not listening to them, but had an awareness about what the you know what type of things that they wanted to do, and by and large, a lot you know and you know most of the young people I talked to were, you know, sort of very happy with the fact that 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 you know this would improve maybe job prospects. They there wasn't a huge problem about sort of sort of more gender mixing at work and things like that um, at work. I should say you know I should stress at work. You know this was sort of seen as something that was was good for the country because as lots of young men said to me, you know, what's the point in spending all of this money on female education of having the world's biggest female university in Riyadh, you know, Princess Nora University, if you're not actually going to tap into this human capital and that's actually very important. So that by and large was sort of, was well accepted and, and became, you know, sort of, sort of very quickly became, became very normal. Um, you know, just as women driving did. And, uh, you know, once women went to work in public, you know, then it was obvious that the, that the, the women driving thing was going to happen fairly quickly, um, which, it, which it did. So, you know, I think, you know, I, th I, I think the, you know, young people are, if you're young, when you're young, you know, which for me was quite a long time ago, you know, but when you're young, I think you are, you know, you tend to be optimistic, um, you tend to be, you know, sort of a bit idealistic, whatever, because that's the nature of being young. And that, so I think this, you know, this obviously resonated with that sort of feeling that this could sort of, you know, this could actually open up more doors, provide sort of more opportunities and that you wouldn't just be stuck sort of having to, you know, go to university, you know, go to work for a big um, state owned enterprise or multinational company where you would just be a number and you'd stay in that job until you retired and halas that's it you know you know <laughs> this sort of you know it, it sort of mixed all of this up and of course that sort of that was something that that, that, that a lot of young people you know found exciting um i you know i think there, you know, just sort of, to, to, you know, just sort of some anecdotes, which I think sort of um, <coughs> explain this. I mean, I remember last summer um, meeting some students who I taught, because I taught at King Fahad University for Petroleum and Minerals for seven and a half years. And I met some students who I taught there back in 2013. And I keep up with most of my former students. And, you know, we met and um, we were talking about all of these things that we're talking about now, obviously. And I said to them, I said, well, you know, when you studied with me back in 2013, out of the three classes that I was teaching in that semester, which was approximately 120 young men, I said, how many of them had either a part time job or volunteered? And they laughed and they said, well, probably nobody. And I said, and today, which is obviously 2019, how many of those same number of students that I've been teaching, you know, this semester, how many of them? have a part-time job or volunteer. 70%, 80%? That's a huge change, huge change in a, such a short time. And of course, you know, having a part-time job, volunteering um, is not just, which volunteering is enormous in Saudi Arabia now. And of course, volunteering and part-time jobs, it's not just about, you know, making some money. It, it is also about, you know, doing something that you can put on your CV learning new skills and competences but it's also extremely important it extends your social circle you know you you mix with different people you meet different people you know you are away from maybe you know your college or your family or what have you so so if you're 21 yes it's exciting you know it, it, it it's it's great you know so so it's very understandable why these things you know became popular but it's also very good because because to my mind, that's what that has done is it's changed um, mentalities towards work. Um, and, you know, it would be unthinkable, you know, you just wouldn't have seen young Saudis, whether male or female, you know, sort of doing the sorts of jobs that you see them doing now, uh, whether full time or part time, um, which is, you know, I think is very important. And I think um, particularly when we think today of the ramifications of the pandemic and how that's going to change the social contract, how that's going to change sort of migrant communities, maybe going back to their home countries and things like this. You know, there are actually, you know, there's going to be more 
need for for young Saudis to do these types of jobs yeah. because obviously you can't you know you can't have 12 percent in unemployment amongst nationals and at the same time employ vast numbers of 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 foreigners from other countries i mean it doesn't make sense you know but so you uh, me to interject yes, um, please please <laughs> and, and you talked about the new normal um of 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 actually, you know, accepting the new opportunities that were provided by the new vision of mm -hmm. Mohammed bin Salman. But uh, in light of the pandemic, and you mm -hmm. said that, you know, uh, more young people are compelled to yeah. enter the workforce. Mm -hmm. But is it also a similar reflection or does it echo that similar situation in 2014 where, you, where Saudi Arabia experienced a an economic decline because of the oil price oil prices uh, decline mm -hmm. as well. Uh, yeah. Are we seeing the same trend? Are we seeing, will we expect, an, uh, you know, a decrease in job opportunities? Mm -hmm. What, you know, what are the perceptions? That the I mean, no, that's, that's an extremely important point. And actually, I've just completed another research project um, and um, uh, a journal paper, which hopefully is going to come out in September for the Asian Journal of Middle East and Islamic Studies. And it's, it's a special edition on the um, impact of the pandemic on the Middle East. And, and the topic that I have written about is precisely the one that you've just mentioned. Is that how is this going to impact on, on job opportunities for, for young Saudis? And so obviously I couldn't meet, I couldn't have focus groups and I couldn't meet people in person because of the, you know, the social restrictions. But I did a, a written survey with around 350 young Saudis, you know, asking them how they saw this affecting their future. And it was very interesting because one thing that, you know, that came out quite clearly was, Concern, <clears throat> concern that, that the situation would be very similar to that in 2014, just after the oil price collapse. Um, I mean, I remember in 2014, I was working at King Fahad University at the time. Um, the students at King Fahad University are Saudi Arabia's academic elite. Um, not social, but academic elite. They're there on merit and they deserve to be there. And... Um, you know, they're mainly engineering students or business business graduates. And pre the oil price collapse in 2014, you know, most of them would get five, six, seven job offers. That was, you know, that was normal. Um, and then suddenly post the oil price collapse, um, depending on their major, I mean, some were not getting any. You know, um, I mean, chemical engineering, for example, was very badly affected. So you suddenly found, you know, young people suddenly, you know, they, they were up, they were unemployed for a year, two years, whatever. It got very bad. It improved, of course. Um, it did improve. Um, and sort of sort of after 2016, things started to get better. It never went back to pre 2014. Um, and, and in a way, I think. This and obviously Vision Twenty Vision Twenty Thirty happened because of this, but also this sort of change in mentality amongst young people, also um, was a consequence of this happening, which was not actually a bad thing to happen. I think it had needed to happen for a long time, so that you know the att attitudes to work and uh, public sector jobs, private sector jobs, etc., that had changed. Um, but obviously, of course, now there's this fear that this will happen again. And already, for example, young, you know, lots of the young undergraduates that I've spoken to in the last couple of weeks, you know, we're talking about how, well, you know, as part of my undergraduate degree in engineering, I have to complete an internship or a work placement, you know. Um, and of course, I can't do that now because, all, you know, everything's closed or they're just not taking people on. Or I was going on an exchange program overseas, you know, to Georgia Tech or something, and I can't do that now, you know. Or I had a part time job and that's gone. And so it's not just the sort of the impact of the pandemic on job availability itself it's also the impact of the pandemic on education and sort of educational opportunities that would be sort of normal and obviously yes i mean you can see you know you can see that this is of huge concern um, and and is very worrying particularly if you are unfortunate to be to either have just graduated or you're going to be graduating this year but again you know this is not this is not just an issue for for young Saudis. This is a this is an issue for young people everywhere, isn't it? It's uh, we're all you know everybody's having to sort of rethink this this new normal. But mm. 
Yeah. Um, let's dive in a bit, into a bit about systemic discrimination. I think that that's quite a hot topic at the minute uh, globally. Um, and in your book, you talked about how there is a gradual shift of self-identity from Muslim to Saudis among, among young men. But you qualify it later on that this statement by saying that, you know, there's still uh, inclusionary and exclusionary parts of, of what it means to be Saudi. Mm -hmm. And this could be on the grounds of religious sect, uh, mm -hmm. tribal or regional affinity. Mm -hmm. So let us start with um, perhaps sectarian concerns. And, and let me pull out... Um, uh, this quote that I, I saw in your, your book, which was very, very interesting, is, is more of an anecdote, really. So this one uh, was, was actually written by you. Um, or, I mean, you, you presented this anecdote when you discussed um, Sunni Shia relations in, in Saudi Arabia. Mm. And, and how deep does this cleavage go in, in Saudi society? I think it's, I mean, I mean, I think it's very interesting because um, I know, for example, you know, when we were talking to young people from all over the kingdom, not just young Shia, but, but all of them, and, and, and particularly young people, and maybe from going back to what we said before, from regions and things like, like that, you know, they would often say to me, you know, when I, you know, if I go for a job interview, you know, the first thing I'm asked is, you know, who are you? Um, so this, and this obviously raises all of these questions about, you know, identity, personal identity, sort of vis-a-vis -vis sort of national identity. Um, and that's the reason that the, you know, the first chapter of the book is called, you know, is entitled, What is Saudi? Because obviously there's a sort of national identity program when there has been for, for, for many years. It's not, just, it's not just Saudi Vision 2030. It's been, you know, it goes back a long time to the creation of National Day, for example. When I first went to Saudi Arabia, there was no National Day, you know? Uh, and then that was sort of a, a government decision to bring in National Day. And of course, when National Day was first introduced, nobody really knew what it meant or, or, or what we were supposed to do on National Day or anything like that. That's obviously very different now because it is a huge celebration of, the, of, 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 of Saudi identity as a state um, so, but it was very you know but obviously I've always been aware of these sort of sort of these sort of other identities these other identity narratives which are incredibly important to young men whether it's you know their, their, their Islamic identity whether it's their regional identity their family identity their tribal identity their socioeconomic identity you know whether it's their you know their identity because of their educational background where they are alumni from um, online identities as well. I mean, all of this is sort of mixed in together. Um, and of course, if you, you know, when we have online identities, you know, one individual can have multiple online identities depending on the platforms they're using. So this whole issue of identity is, 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 is fascinating and obviously very varied. Um, but it is, you know, it, it, there is, you know, there's a lot of concern obviously that you know who I am depending on my background depending on you know my family's background depending on where I come from depending on what university I went to depending on you know you know what tribe I'm from you know that all of this can either help or hinder um, your your sort of development in society and of course that is sort of basically going back to the perennial problem problem of wasta you know which is sort of all about that so no I mean and you know I think people around you know there was sort of for example there was a point I you know sort of 20 years ago or 15 years ago whatever that when you know there was a lot of talk about sort of um, reduction in tribal identities or a reduction in some of these sort of identity narratives and that they were no longer so important. But um, I don't think that's the case. I think that they are still extremely important. Um, and I think one of the reasons a lot of these, these sort of identity narratives continue to be very important is that when you live in a society that, um, any society in the world that is going through very rapid, uh, unprecedented change, 
that can actually be a very um, difficult time for a lot of people. You know, it can, it, can, it can cause a lot of disquiet because the sort of the status quo that you were brought up with or the status quo that you've always felt was, was normal is suddenly being shaken. And I think, you know, what a lot of people tend to do, obviously, is if they are sort of concerned by this, then what you, you very often do is you sort, of, you sort of cling to those identity narratives that offer you sort of security you know, that, 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 that are familiar. So I think I, you know, and, and this, so I think, you know, it's not that it's not, it's not that there isn't a Saudi identity because of course there is, but I think it's, you know, I think it's, it's a very sort of complex one. And I think a lot of young, I know when I talk to a lot of young people in the focus groups about it, I said, okay. And the reason the chapter is called, what is Saudi? Because that's the question I asked them. I said, what is Saudi? You know, and I got all sorts of, you know, answers. Some were extremely vague. Some were, some, some people saying to me, well, you know, I've never really thought about that. And other people saying things to me like, oh, well, the only time I think about that was when I go abroad. Because when I'm overseas, I'm Saudi. But when I come back home, then I sort of revert back to sort of other identity narratives, sort of related to my family, for example, and things like this. So, you know, it, there, there is without a doubt a, you know, sort of a growing sense of a national identity, but I think it's very contested and it's very complex. Uh, it's not something we can generalize. And I think, you know, it, it, again, it depends on who you talk to, where you talk to, and sort of in what situation you're talking to them about. But quite clearly, you know, it, it, this is not something that's, 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 <laughs> that's, that's since the launch of Vision 2030, for example, has gone away or anything. And, and I rather suspect that with the, you know, the ramifications of the current um, coronavirus pandemic and, and, the, and the impact that's going, that's going to have on not just the national economy of Saudi Arabia, but the regional economy and indeed the global one as well. I mean, this could actually exacerbate some of those things. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And uh, again, this, these are, uni you know, it, it's interesting because these are actually, you know, these are actually universal issues. Mm. Yeah. Uh, before I move on to my next question, I would like to invite everyone who has, who has okay. been thinking about putting forward a question to, to put your question in the chat box and we'll try to answer them as far as possible. Uh, meanwhile, let me put forward another question on our identity because we talked about uh, you know, sectarian concerns. Uh, what about tribes? Uh, you, you talked about it in your last answer and, and mm -hmm. there is... And as your book mentioned, there's a retribalization of self. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in academic scholarship, there's really a difficulty in defining the tribe because it's no longer uh, referring to what it, what it was in, in anthropology no. as a primitive, pastoral, no. nomadic no. way of life. No. And you write that, you know, real and invented tribes remain very important as a social identity marker. So could you tell us a bit more about what it means for young men to be part of a tribe and what are the governments, the Saudi government's attitudes towards uh, tribal clusters? Yeah. Well, I think, it, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, there was a there was obviously a, um, a move, if you like, you know, to sort of depoliticize tribes or to sort of sort of to take away sort of that sort of, you know, sort of any sort of political sort of power that tribes might have had. Um, and I think what was interesting after that was we saw sort of a reemergence of tribal identity more in the sort of sociocultural arena. So a lot of young men. Um, became very interested in their tribal history and their tribal literature and then you know the tribal poetry uh, things like this and so there was a sort of reassertion of this this identity um, um, through more through the sort of socio-cultural um, uh, area uh, I mean I think you know I think something that's often not thought about maybe so much when we think about Saudi Arabia is that um, you know, not everybody in Saudi Arabia is wealthy. I mean, you know, poverty is, you know, a problem in Saudi Arabia in certain parts of the kingdom, obviously, as it is everywhere. But as Mohammed Ramadi, who of course has, you know, written extensively on the on the Saudi on the Saudi economy, has, has always said, you know, it's it's actually very difficult to to measure poverty in the kingdom. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is because what the tribe or the extended family offer, obviously offers very often is a is a safety net 
you know, very often a, a financial safety net to people who are, you know, going through hard times economically. Um, so it's, it's also, and now with what we see happening because of the pandemic, you know, is that going to sort of reassert itself again as something that's very important as well? So it's this, it, it's, it's this uh, so you can think about it as an identity narrative in, in terms of sort of, you know, the sort of the sort of the, the sort of sociocultural context in that, that this is a way of expressing, you know, sort of my collective family identity. But you can also see it as 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 also a safety net. You know, that, that, that if I'm in trouble, you know, if I don't have enough money to get married, if you know, whatever, whatever, I actually have these people to sort of fall back on. These people will, you know, these people will back me up. And I think that's 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 also very important. And it's obviously going to be interesting to see. You know, if we have, you know, if we have this conversation or a similar conversation like this in a year's time, for example, it'll be interesting to see, you know, to what extent maybe that that has actually happened. But again, it goes, you know, I mean, you know, people often ask me, what are the three most important things in Saudi Arabia? You know, and I always answer, you know, family, family, family. Um, because that's what it is, you know, the, 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 <coughs> the nuclear family, the extended family, the tribal family. I mean, this is an intrinsic part of the makeup of the kingdom. And it's not, you know, I know it's not a, you know, I don't think it's surprising that this is the only country in the world that's named after a family, because at the end of the day, that's the family is the absolute main political unit in Saudi Arabia. It's how everything works, you know, it's the interconnections between the families. It, it, it's, it's, it, and, and that's also very interesting because people, um, I think a lot of people who don't know Saudi Arabia, a lot of people, you know, sort of outside the kingdom sort of underestimate the sort of the resilience of um, Saudi Arabia in terms of the sort of its diverse societies. And I think that these very strong, very powerful bonds that that tie people together in units, family units, as I say, whether nuclear extended or beyond that, you know, they, 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 they give Saudi Arabia this sort of resilience and this resilience to weather a lot of the changes and a lot of the storms that we've seen. Um, I mean, this is a country that, you know, until the 1970s was basically in the 16th century. You know, and, 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 and people sort of think about Saudi Arabia not changing very much. I mean, this is a country that has changed like that overnight, you know. Uh, and when I'm sort of talking about Saudi Arabia, for example, in, in Britain, you know, I point out to my audience there, I said, you know, this country went from Queen Elizabeth I to Queen Elizabeth II in 40 years. You know, we, it, we did it in 400. So I think it's amazing, really, when you think of the, the pace of change and the, the, uh, the pace of social change as well, that, that actually how, how, how society has actually managed to sort of, sort of, sort of, <laughs> sort of absorb a lot of this change without really any sort of major disruption and I think one of the reasons for that is because of these very 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 strong bonds which form this very powerful foundation um, uh, which I don't see I see adapting you know I see these things adapting rather than sort of changing and I think sometimes we talk about change in Saudi Arabia to, for some of these issues but actually the word we should be using is adaption because a lot of these are, are fundamentally in in their nature not changing but the way that that, that they, they they operate if you like is adapting to sort of the realities of 21st century globalized saudi arabia